We have assembled a group of all-stars. Um, when it comes to Asia and Asia policy, CSIS's Asia wing is second to none, and uh, these four are perfect examples of that. Um, before I do some of the introductions, just a few logistical notes, if we can make sure the cell phones are on silent. And when we get to the Q&A section, if you could try to the extent possible to make it to a microphone, because we are video and audio recording and getting a transcript. Uh, for those in the back, it's not a barrier to entry. I can repeat your question, but try to, uh, to make it to the microphone. Um, we'll start off um, with, with Bonnie Glazer. She'll give us a little insight into who Xi Jinping is why he's coming. Bonnie is a senior fellow at the Freeman Chair in China Studies, also senior associate for CSIS's Pacific Forum. Um, after that, we'll go to Ernie Bauer. Ernie directs our Southeast Asia program. Uh, it was Ernie's conference yesterday on Singapore, where the foreign minister made a few comments about the U.S.-China relationship, sort of leading, leading us nicely into this visit. Um, so Ernie will put it in sort of a regional context. Uh, Matt Goodman is our the newest member of the CSIS expert team. He is just joined as the Simon Chair in Political Economy. Uh, came straight from the Obama administration, where he was the coordinator for the ASEAN, or sorry, for the APEC and the EAS forums. Um, also has long experience dealing with the G8 and G20 summits, so we'll certainly call on Matt again uh, in May when Chicago hosts the G8 summits. But for our purposes here today, he'll sort of lay out the state of U.S.-China uh, economic relations. And then we'll finish with, uh, with Mike Green. You all know Mike. He's our uh, Japan Chair Senior Advisor. Uh, was the head of Asia at the National Security Council under the Bush administration. And he'll sort of round this out with a little geopolitical context um, and talk about some of the places around the world that have been in the news recently where the U.S. and China don't exactly see eye to eye. So again, thank you all for coming. Um, and Bonnie, I'll let you lead us off. Good morning, everyone. Start with uh, some background as to who Xi Jinping is. Uh, he is currently a vice uh, president and uh, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission in China. He also heads up the Central Party School. And as of this fall, he will begin the process of taking on the three uh, most important titles that senior Chinese leaders uh, take on, uh, probably one at a time. Uh, in this fall at the 18th Party Congress, he will become the Secretary General of China's Communist Party. In the spring, he will take on the, uh, p the title of President. The third title is a bit uncertain. Um, in, in past practice in, in, in China, the uh, current leader has retained the post of the head of the Central Military Commission for two years before he has passed it on to his uh, successor. This time, it, it's a little bit unclear. There is some discussion about the possibility, I think, that he might take on the position earlier. But if past practice as a guide, um, he will not become the head of the military until uh, 2014. Uh, but of course, he remains an, a member, nevertheless, as vice chairman of the Central Military Commission. Vice President Biden, as you probably know, uh, has met with Xi Jinping twice previously. They met in Rome, and then Biden was hosted by Xi Jinping in uh, China last summer. And they had about nine hours of conversation together, uh, some of it in uh, larger group meetings and some of it just uh, the, the two of them with interpreters. They had dinner together in uh, Chengdu. And they have already talked about a broad range uh, of issues. And it, I think, has been a very rich uh, conversation. Uh, they have talked about uh, the role of uh, 
the U.S.-China relationship in the world. They've talked about human rights. Uh, they have even talked about the need for better coordination between uh, the civilians and the military in China. So this is an ongoing conversation. Xi Jinping comes here now uh, to meet not only with Vice President Biden and others in the United States, but I think most importantly with President Obama. And they are going to meet together in the Oval, Oval Office, and this is an opportunity for uh, for the, the two leaders to establish a rapport, to get to know each other better, if, of course, and this is, a, this is definitely an if, President Obama were to serve a second term, um, this would certainly be a, a very, very important uh, relationship. The playbook for this visit, and uh, my colleague Mike Green will talk more about this, is the 2002 visit by Hu Jintao, because he came here before he took on the uh, the leadership titles in, in China. So many of the things that he that Xi will be doing here are actually based on uh, what Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao did, and uh, Mike Green was uh, in the in the NSC at the time, and he'll talk more about that. Uh, I, I know that you're going to learn more from uh, from the White House about some of the things that are going to take place on this visit. I think there's a uh, a phone call that's for the for the media that's taking place on Friday. My understanding uh, is that there will be a a luncheon held by uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, Vice President Biden, and as you know, uh, he will be uh, Xi Jinping will be going out to Iowa and uh, and to uh, Los Angeles. Uh, in terms of issues that are going to be discussed, uh, again, my colleague Matt Goodman will talk about the economic issues, uh, but uh, there will be a range of issues on security issues. Uh, the um, uh, Iran and North Korea are going to be uh, very high on the agenda. Human rights will certainly be, be discussed. And the military relationship is going to be discussed as well. And Xi Jinping is going to visit the Pentagon as well, just as Hu Jintao in 2002 went to the Pentagon. And this is going to be, I think, a discussion that is an attempt to inject some um, new life, if you will, uh, into the military relationship, which has been pretty stagnant uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and I think that the, the president and the vice president will also be speaking to the issue of the importance of establishing an ongoing, um, sustainable, uh, cooperative uh, military relationship with China as the, um, the relationship has become somewhat more competitive um, and occasionally more tense uh, between our, our two militaries. Uh, so I'll turn the floor over um, to my other colleagues um, and happy to answer questions later. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, I'm Ernie Bauer. I run the Southeast Asia program here. Uh, you know, I think the Southeast Asians will be extremely uh, interested in how this visit plays out. Uh, they, um, they see the U.S.-China relationship as extremely important to them, uh, not surprising when you consider that the United States uh, had been the largest uh, trading partner and still is the largest investor in that region um, up until about 2008 when China and its growing economic might sort of took over. So they'll be watching the, uh, the, the relationship uh, very closely, and this visit, the Xi visit, is very important. What the Southeast Asians want to see is, uh, you know, the United States and China getting along, but not becoming sort of a, a G2, you know, where they, uh, two two countries, sort of rule the world. I think that scenario has has been pretty much settled and not headed that way. Um, where <laughs> we tried that, I think, in Obama's last visit to. Uh, or his first visit as president uh, to, to China. Um, but they also don't want to see the U.S. relationship uh, with China uh, to be confrontational. So I, I think um, they'll be watching every word and, uh, and uh, nuance of this trip very carefully. The trip is important for the United States, too. Um, we have engaged in uh, an Asia strategy uh, that the administration has called a pivot uh, back to to Asia. Uh, for those of us who are in this business, I think we see more of sort of a, a refocusing, uh, rebalancing rather than a pivot. But um, uh, it's semantics. Mike Mike might have some fun with this. He he did yesterday. <laughs> uh, um, he's pretty pretty funny, and he talks about it. But um, 
I enjoy it. Uh, I think uh, that's important because this the she visit is an opportunity for the White House and the United States to talk about how important Asia is and why it's important, uh, both from a uh, security point of view and a, uh, a trade point of view. The, the structures that we have built or, or that we are building or investing in in Asia, in the Asia Pacific, include security and trade structures. On, on the security front, we have just joined the East Asia Summit, the EAS, which is uh, part of, which it does include China, and it's an ASEAN based structure. And on the trade front, uh, we had sort of not had a trade uh, policy for Asia up until about eight months ago when we, um, we stepped it up. We've joined the TPP, which is the tra Trans Pacific Partnership. And we, we've got the uh, US-Korea uh, free trade agreement put through. So Matt might talk a little bit more about this. That's very important to Southeast Asia to see that the US is bringing together uh, security and trade to the table. The end goal of American strategy, I believe, uh, is or, or should be to include China at the table in these, uh, in these regional structures. So we don't want to. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and, and, and Ryan referenced it, about whether the United States is trying to contain China. That is absolutely, in my view, uh, not the goal uh, of American strategy. And I think you'll, you'll see the administration um, at pains uh, during this visit to make that clear, that that's not the goal. Um, and it's, it's an important theme for you to, to watch. That's very important to Southeast Asia because they don't want, and, and our other partners in Asia, because they don't want to have to choose between the United States and China. On the security front, expect um, some discussion. I don't know if they'll be public about it, but there will be discussions about regional security issues. Uh, that includes Burma or Myanmar, depending on your politics. Um, you know, China had sort of had free running with, uh, with, the, with the Burmese until the Burmese decided to move forward with their political reforms. And, and now that looks like uh, you know, if, if things stay in the direction they're going now, um, this would be resolving uh, some of the political issues and opening up uh, Burma politically and economically would, would take away a real ball and chain that's been around ASEAN's leg for the last 20 years. Um, ASEAN, of course, is, you know, 10 countries, 650 million people with a $2 trillion GDP, and it's our fourth largest trading partner. So, so getting Burma right and getting ASEAN strengthened is part of American strategy, and it's not clear, I think, um, you know, how the Chinese uh, view uh, this political evolution in Burma. I think it would be an interesting issue if it comes up and, and one for you to watch for. The other one is the South China Sea. Um, it's a point of, it has been a, a contentious or, or feels like a contentious point between um, our two countries, but it's really, uh, the issue is really about um, China and the Southeast Asians resolving disputes uh, over, uh, there's, there's six countries actually disputing um, uh, the South China Sea, claims in the South China Sea, and the American position is that they want to see this resolved according to rule of law. Uh, and and through multilateral discussions where that's appropriate. So um, you, may, you might see a little bit of, of discussion on that. I'll stop there and uh, cede the floor to Matt Goodman. Thanks, Ernie. Um, as Ryan said, I'm Matt Goodman. I'm uh, newly arrived at CSIS and working on global economic issues. Um, pleased to see you all. Um, so as you know, the U.S. and China have a, have a broad uh, complex and growing economic relationship, um, one that is marked by both uh, areas of mutual benefit and, and areas of cooperation, as well as um, areas of competition and, and um, friction in some areas. Um, the administration, the U.S. administration, the Obama administration um, has a adopted a fairly consistent approach to that of, of previous administrations of the last uh, 30 years of both engaging with, with China economically as well as uh, managing um, uh, the friction, engaging bilaterally uh, through a number of uh, uh, interactions, engage, engaging regionally through uh, forums like APEC um, and globally through forums now uh, like the G20. Um, uh, but also, also uh, in those contexts, um, working on these areas of friction. Um, the friction, as you know, ranges from uh, issues to do with uh, rebalancing of macroeconomic forces, uh, currency issues, as well as uh, intellectual property 
uh, uh, concerns and uh, a range of, uh, of market access and trade issues. Um, this uh, kind of visit, the visit of Vice President Xi, is, is what's known in the jargon as an action-forcing event, uh, which um, leads to uh, uh, both sides trying to produce um, deliverables, another term of art, in the run-up uh, to, to an event like this. Um, and, and certainly, I think the Obama administration is going to want to demonstrate an ability to move uh, forward the economic agenda and make progress on that agenda. But um, I, I think uh, in the context of a visit that is, is largely about relationship building and getting to know each other, um, I don't think expectations should be very high for significant breakthroughs on the, the, the major uh, issues in the economic relationship, whether currency or intellectual property or the other big, the big issues. Um, there will probably be uh, some small uh, deliverables which are being negotiated um, as we speak. Uh, and uh, there will be some buying. Uh, there's a large delegation uh, uh, of, of agricultural interests from China that will probably make large agricultural uh, purchases, um, uh, perhaps during the visit to Iowa. Um, and there will be, a, as I understand it, a focus on uh, in, inbound Chinese investment during a forum in Los Angeles that, uh, that is being organized um, uh, for the Xi delegation. Um, so, but I think most of the big issues will be reserved for other forums later in the spring and later in the year, the strategic and economic dialogue, uh, which will be held sometime in the May, June period, um, and, uh, and the G20, uh, some of these issues will be taken up there, and then later in the fall in the uh, Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, uh, which, uh, which is really the place that, that most of these issues are arbitrated. So with that um, a brief introduction, I will pivot to Mike and let him take over from there. I think the, uh, since our friends in Beijing found pivot too aggressive and threatening, I've heard the administration is going to change it to pirouette. Uh, we're going to pirouette to Asia. Um, so, you know, the, who, the Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping visit is, uh, is rightly garnering a lot of attention. Um, even my four-year-old son is now fully engaged. We were driving in the car, listening to NPR recently, and uh, I think it was Jackie. But anyway, whoever the announcer was said, uh, Xi Jinping, the vice president of China, whose father was a famous gorilla. And from the back of the car, I hear my four-year-old say, his daddy was a gorilla? <laughs> and then my wife pointed, she says, don't worry, your father's a famous chimpanzee. Um, <laughs> This, uh, I was in the NSC in 2002 when Hu Jintao came, and I think in some ways the, uh, the, the comparison is, uh, is, is illustrative of how U.S.-China relations have evolved um, uh, of some of, and how the challenges in the relationship have multiplied. But at the end of the day, and at the end of the day as Matt suggested, I think the, the game plan for the Obama administration may be generally the same on this visit as it was for us in 2002 which was, is to lower expectations of deliverables, focus on the relationship. In, in May 2002, when Hu Jintao came as vice president, um, he had a similar itinerary. He met with the president, the vice president, Secretary of State Colin Powell, uh, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. He gave a speech in San Francisco. Um, the message from the Chinese side, from Hu Jintao and his delegation, was um, on the importance of U.S.-China relations, um, conveying uh, the strong uh, signal that, that who would be a, a, a responsible and strong steward of the U.S.-China relationship, that he was not going to change the fundamental Deng Xiaoping line of, uh, of engaging and not challenging uh, U.S. leadership in the world while standing up for China's interests. Um, his speech in California at San Francisco is worth looking at. The press from the Chinese side is very, very positive about the relationship. Um, Ari Fleischer and those of us in the NSC who briefed on and off the background um, focused on the relationship, the ability of the U.S. and China to work together, um, but mentioned, you'll notice in every White House briefing from Ari or from those of us who did it on background, Taiwan, Tibet, human rights, trade, and, and, and made a point of not letting any of the controversial issues fall off the radar scope. Um, and that was sort of the balance. And it, for the most part, it worked. Um, the, 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 the main point was to invest in the relationship with Hu Jintao, who, who we didn't know well. The administration does not know Xi Jinping that well. The vice president has met him. Um, we will be dealing with him for uh, 10 years, probably, uh, this president and the next president, um, uh, whether, no matter what happens in November. Um, and so building that relationship is important. President Bush um, did that, and his relationship with Hu Jintao was, was pretty, pretty good. 
And um, in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship, the ties between the leaders are important out of proportion to what they would be in other bilateral relationships. Why? Well, for example, just look at the, at the security relationship. The, um, the, the current leadership, civilian leadership of the PLA, consists of two people. Uh, Xi Jinping is one of them. He's the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission. Hu Jintao is the chairman. Below that level, there is no civilian oversight of the PLA. And so um, a lot of things in the Chinese system uh, which are uh, stovepiped, uh, particularly on the security side, really kind of get integrated at the leadership level. And the leadership relationship with the American president is really important. It's also important because there are a lot of contradictory voices in U.S.-China relations on both sides, um, all over the gamut from the China threat to the, the desire that Chinese foreign direct investment will increase. And it's really the periodic summits and relationships between the two presidents that set the overall tone and that are necessary to continually remind audiences in both countries that we are basically continuing on the line begun uh, 30, 40, 40 years ago, um, which is that we may have differences, but we're focused on expanding a stable, cooperative China-US relationship. And we're not seeking containment confrontation. China's not seeking revisionism. Um, and really, that has to be set from the top. If the foreign minister in China says it, it's, it's a blip. The Secretary of State says that it's got more oomph, but it's still not as powerful as, as coming from the top. So the relationship's important. It's important to invest in it. That said, I think this is a harder task for the Obama administration than it was for us in 2002. In the 2000 election, China was not a major issue. Um, after 9-11, uh, the focus of the press and the country was obviously on terrorism much more than on problems with China. In 2002, the U.S. business community was pretty much um, on the same page about the importance of the U.S.-China economic relationship. Today, the business community is badly divided, and major multinationals um, like Dow Chemical are going to court openly over intellectual property rights violations and other things that in 2002 they would never have done. They would have tried to quietly work within the system, um, hold together the American economic viewpoint that the U.S.-China economic relationship is fragile and has to be nurtured because it's so important uh, to the American economy and business. There's, there's, there's much less consensus now. There's much more willingness to openly um, take complaints about China to court, to USTR, to the press. Um, in some ways, the human rights situation in China is now worse. In 2002, 2003, we could pass in a summit meeting an envelope to Jiang Zemin um, with a list of uh, political prisoners, and some would be released. And it may have been a token, but it was something. We could talk about human rights. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, we, don't, we don't have the ability um, to get political prisoners released um, the way we did because of, frankly, a, uh, uh, a, a more paranoid view of the Chinese government towards internal dissent in recent years. Um, and then we have a whole new range of problems that were only uh, beginning to show up in 2002, in particular cyber, where you have former directors of national intelligence and the FBI openly saying what they s could not say before, which is there is a Chinese massive assault on, on, on cyberspace. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, the um, collision with Japan over the Senkaku Diaoyutai, the South China Sea. So it's a much more complicated environment. Um, and a lot more political pressure in the U.S. this election year on China issues than there was in 2002 when, when Hu Jintao came. Frankly, the situation on China is also, on China's side, is also different. Um, Xi Jinping is a Dengist. He essentially, I think, follows the Deng Xiaoping line um, of pragmatism. His, his father, the famous gorilla, was famously pragmatic. Um, and. Uh, that's continuity from Zhang and Hu. He's also the first leader who is not um, handpicked by Deng Xiaoping for promotion to the top level. He was not, as um, the Chinese leadership analysts say, he was not helicoptered up through the ranks personally by Deng Xiaoping. So he comes into the leadership with, in a different context. And there are still things about him that we may find out on this trip and in the months and years ahead. Um, 
one of the questions is his relationship with the PLA, which Bonnie may want to talk more about when we get into the Q&A. His father was a general. His wife is a famous singing major general. She sings patriotic songs. It, it, always, it sounds like a Gilbert, it sounds like Pirates of Penzance. She's the modern, modern, model of a modern major general, um, but she's a very popular singer. Um, but there's still a debate among the experts about whether he can shape the PLA because of this, or the PLA will shape him. He was uh, party boss in Fujian, and so there's some speculation that on maritime issues and towards Southeast Asia and Taiwan, he might be more agile, more flexible. But there's a counter argument that he'll actually be much more clever <laughs> at advancing China's maritime demands. Um, the Dalai Lama uh, and the Tibetan movement had some hope. Hu Jintao was party boss in Tibet. They knew it would be bad for Tibet when he became uh, president because he had such a bad experience in Lhasa. There was some hope that, um, that Xi Jinping might might do better by the Tibetans because his father had a particular view and, 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 and more open view towards uh, the Dalai Lama in Tibet. But in July, when Xi Jinping traveled to Lhasa, it was pretty, uh, the message was pretty hard line. Uh, and towards the international system where Hu Jintao was very careful not to engage in a kind of a dialectic or debate about China's system versus the West. In his public speaking, Xi Jinping has been more willing to criticize the West. His famous three did nots in Mexico City where he said, we did not create poverty, we did not create um, job losses, and sort of preemptively criticized the criticism of China's e economy. Um, and then the, finally, the two issues, North Korea and Iran, which are getting uh, more complicated. In North Korea, Xi Jinping accompanied Hu Jintao to the North Korean embassy in Beijing after the death of Kim Jong-il to express condolences, is clearly fully engaged in the strategy uh, of Hu Jintao to maintain stability on the peninsula, a so-called two-Korea policy, where even though China's trade with South Korea is, two hun is 100 times larger than its trade with North Korea, it's, an, it's still an equidistant policy, which drives the South Koreans bonkers. And Xi Jinping's going to continue that and do what I think China can to keep North Korea propped up under Kim Jong-un, which is problematic because the nuclear issues continue to to uh, develop in on, on, uh, helpful ways. And then on Iran, where China imports 11% of its oil from Iran, has a $40 billion trade deficit. Um, the 11% is comparable to where Ch Japan or Korea have been in recent years, but their numbers are clearly going down rapidly, Japan and Korea. Um, but China's are not. And there's some debate about whether Beijing is stuck because of a desire, a mercantile desire to exploit the opening to get cheap oil from Iran, whether it's bureaucratic intransigence, or whether some in Beijing actually like the idea of Iran keeping us off balance and the US pulled into the Middle East and away from Asia. So a lot of questions about Xi Jinping still, even though he is essentially a dungist and no one expects major changes in overall Chinese policy. But his style is different. He's under more nationalistic pressure. There's more pressure on our side. And for all those reasons, um, I think, um, Matt got out of the White House just in time, because uh, this will be harder um, next week than it was in May 2002 um, to, to invest in the relationship, emphasize the positive, um, low expectations for deliverables when there's enormous pressure for deliverables. Thanks. Folks, again, just a reminder, try and make your way to the microphone, and we'll take your questions. Uh, thanks for an excellent overview. If I may, I have a pair of questions that address discrete uh, commenters. Uh, I would start with Mr. Goodman. Uh, I'd, in pre uh, she, she reporting, we've sort of sensed that there's a divide in the arrangements business-wise where the Chinese are emphasizing buying missions and soybeans and things like that. And we, the United States, wants to get into the structural issues. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting a, a White House summit to get into the weeds on that, but generally speaking, a difference of emphasis. And we kind of had that with Japan 20 odd years ago, too, with you know, the omiyage diplomacy and buying big stuff, but not really dealing with trade barriers. So I'm wondering what you think about that as a, as a sort of a fault line going forward in the new relationship. Uh, that's my question. And then to Ernie, on the South China Sea, yeah. when the United States formally does not take a stance, but they do say it must adhere to international law, <coughs> including the famous UN Treaty that we have not yet ratified, which set that aside. Okay. But by advocating um, following international law, are we not essentially siding with the Southeast Asians? Because there's not many readings of international law that would recognize the, the, nine, the Kaotong or the Nine Dotted Line. Those. 
Also, please, just one note. When you ask your questions, take a minute to identify yourself for the. Thank you. Uh, uh, Paul Eckert of Reuters News Agency. Thanks. Um, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, these visits always have elements of both of those um, things. I mean, they always have an element of, of, of buying um, and an element of resolve, trying to resolve um, issues. Um, the Chinese inevitably are going to focus more on buying things, and, you know, that's a good thing. We want to sell things, so, so that's, that's fine. I think the administration will welcome that. Um, but it's obviously not getting at some of the deeper issues, as you say. Um, and, and certainly the administration is going to try behind the scenes to, to, to address some of those those key issues. But as I said, I think the purpose of this visit um, in the minds of the administration, even the administration and certainly the, the Chinese side, is more getting to know you and building relationships. And um, uh, I think they're, they're, they're focusing on uh, somewhat, somewhat narrower objectives that, that feed into the bigger concerns. Um, but I don't think this is the forum where they're going to try to um, resolve some of the big issues. Um, I think there, there are other, you know, other points during the year when, when they'll be able to take those on. On, uh, Southeast, on uh, the South China Sea, um, put me on the record as saying, we, you know, we should sign the UNCLOSE treaty. Just uh, I'm not afraid of that one. Uh, I really think we should do that. Um, but I don't think we're, the intent here is not to side with the Southeast Asians. It is to, um, I, I think we felt the need to uh, say something, though. Uh, the, what, what's happened over the last uh, four or five years is, you know, Chinese economic power really did, you know, it, it made a huge impression on Southeast Asia. They had the sort of charm offensive that, that went on since the, the uh, started around the time of the financial, Asian financial crisis in the late uh, 90s. And I think the Chinese started to test whether, you know, their, their new um, uh, economic and, and military uh, power could, could help define, you know, new, new definitions of sovereignty in, in the South China Sea in particular. And the Southeast Asians uh, have re reacted to that and responded to it. This process of working with ASEAN uh, over a code of conduct uh, on, the so on how to resolve disputes in the South China Sea is one that I think the, the U.S. administration supports. And um, that uh, the, the issue that the Chinese were not comfortable with was having ASEAN uh, consult and negotiate together. You know, they, the Chinese wanted to, to take these uh, countries bilaterally. I think the, if the code of conduct um, uh, discussion can go forward, that gives ASEAN the opportunity to try to and, and sh um, get that the right to uh, to discuss those issues as a grouping uh, codified in in that code. Um, so I think this is the the Americans position on this is, is pretty clear. Um, and I think it's it's probably a, a pretty good one, but it's not I don't think it's meant to, uh, you know, side with one side or the other. And Bonnie, you want I, I, I would just add that China's claim is really not clear, and that's part of the problem. I think that the administration is trying to encourage China to make clear whether it is, in fact, a claim that is what you referred to as the cow's tongue. You know, is, is it the sea, or is it just the land features and then the 12-mile territorial waters, 200-mile EEZs, from those that are not, you know, completely submerged, and most of them are, you know, they're, they're rocks and small reefs. And so I think that that's, that's part of the strategy of not only the United States, but all of the other ASEAN uh, nations, that we want the Chinese to be clear about what their claims are, how they justify them, and not just in terms of, you know, historical experience. And then that will lead to a process of perhaps being able to manage them uh, a little bit more easily than, than, than today. Uh, but the Chinese have been deliberately ambiguous. So it's very difficult to know exactly what their claims are. The Chinese submitted in um, 2009 the, um, this map that was something that they had inherited actually from the KMT in Taiwan. This was a map that was established in, it was in 1947, and it originally had 11 dashes um, and today has nine. And that is because two of those dashes were removed because of compromises with Vietnam. And some people believe that that suggests that there could be some room 
for accommodation in the future. Of course, we are facing a more self-confident uh, China today, um, but if you look at the, all of China's um, territorial disputes that it has had with its neighbors, particularly land uh, disputes, many of them have been solved. And, uh, of course, they remain uh, with, uh, with India in particular, uh, and uh, the land border with Vietnam has been solved. But this does suggest that, at least in the past, the Chinese have been willing to compromise on some of these territorial disputes. I think that will be difficult going forward. This is, this is not the era of Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, uh, but it, we cannot rule out that there could be some accommodation. The first part of that process is making the claims clear. Uh, William Wan from the Washington Post. Just a question for Bonnie or Mike about, um, in terms of messaging toward uh, their own audience at home for China, what uh, Xi Jinping would be trying to do, and um, also what the difference between that messaging and what they're trying to present to the U.S. audience is, and how they 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 would try to strike that balance. Yeah. Well. Um one of the reasons why deliverables are unlikely during this trip is that Xi Jinping is vice president, and it would be presumptuous of him to grandstand, so to speak, by solving problems that his boss could not. This is not, this is not an election where the, that's contested. The important thing for Xi Jinping is to not make mistakes and to be treated in a way that his elevation is seen domestically as respected and appreciated and valued around the world. Um, but for him to have breakthroughs would be very unusual and risky because it would be presumptuous vis-a-vis -vis his current boss, and it would, it, it would be very hard to do without creating some debate in Beijing that he had compromised. And he, he doesn't have to sell himself uh, the way, you know, a presidential candidate would in this country. He has to um, sort of go through the ritual and survive it. Um, that's why I, that's why I, why I think deliverables are very unlikely. Now they may try to package these. In the WHO visit in 2002, there were things that looked a little bit like deliverables, an agreement that military to military talks were important and so forth. But for the most part, these were spun within China or explained within China as Hu Jintao implementing agreements that Jiang Zemin had already made with President Bush in Shanghai and Beijing the year before, the, the, in the previous year. Um, and so what may look in the um, press readings like agreements uh, will in fact be um, packaging of things that are not new. You know, the payoff for this visit for the administration is going to come in a year or two, frankly, when, when, when Xi Jinping is, is president and then eventually chairman of the military commission and so forth. As, as far as messaging back home to China, I think that Xi Jinping needs to demonstrate that he can manage this important relationship with the United States. Uh, this is, uh, the Sino-U.S. relationship is going to continue to be important to China uh, for a, a number of reasons. And so he has to be seen as being able to manage that uh, relationship. And then I think that part of that is also showing the domestic audience back home that um, he can protect Chinese interest. He's not going to be too soft on, on the United States. Um, and there will be opportunities uh, that he will have public speeches uh, here. And I imagine that part of the messaging will be to the U.S. audience, China's going to rise peacefully and you don't have to worry about China posing a threat to the world. And part of what he says, I imagine, will be directed towards the audience back home, again, signaling that he can manage the sino us relationship and he can defend Chinese interests at the same time. One, one, one thing about Xi Jinping that will be interesting to watch is, as a person, He's much more confident and charismatic and personable um, than Hu Jintao was. And um, I, I spend a, a lot of time observing or in meetings with Hu Jintao. I have not uh, with Xi Jinping. But those who have, um, uh, leaders in Asia, for example, describe Xi Jinping as, as just much more charismatic. If you were to do a personality test, he'd be an ENTP. Uh, and uh, Xi Jin, uh, Hu Jintao is more of an INTP. He's more of an introvert. He's more cautious. He, he doesn't have the pedigree or the, the, you know, the exposure to the leadership from an early age that Xi Jinping did. So it's possible he'll be you know, a little more creative and dynamic and interesting in his um, meetings here. Um, but but that's more, sorry? Cowboy hats and 
<laughs> well, <laughs> uh, that's more style than substance, though. Let's let one of the backbenchers make their way to the microphone. Thank you. I was you recognize me, Leslie. <laughs> it's up, Margaret Tolive with Bloomberg. Thanks for doing this. I wanted to ask sort of the flip side of William's question, which is um, how this administration handles the positioning of this, given the fact that the 2012 election like started two years ago and is full swing. So um, how, how does President Obama play what he hopes to accomplish out of it in terms of you know, domestic politics, balancing that against what he really wants to accomplish in terms of foreign policy and long-term, whatever, strategy? And then um, what does Romney do? What does Gingrich do? Do they mess with him the whole time she's here? Or how does that work? Um, is is uh, she speaking to Congress? Do we know yet? And if not, why not? Um, and uh, I guess that's it. U.S. politics. <laughs> Thanks. Matt, maybe maybe a comment on the Republican trade war? Um, thanks. Um, so, um, I mean, clearly um, China is going to play, is playing into the um, political debate this year in the U.S., um, and I think both sides are going to want to demonstrate both, I mean, in the same, in a, in a, in a strange way, you know, similar to the transition in China. They need to show that they, they can manage this relation, this important relationship. Um, in our case, that means they, they need to demonstrate that, that we can work um, cooperatively on a range of global, um, regional, um, bilateral issues, and those include um, uh, both security and, uh, and political security and uh, economic issues. Um, I think uh, that, uh, as I said, I think the, the, the President is going to, in this particular um, interaction, is going to want to focus more on uh, the importance of uh, of having a good, solid uh, 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 relationship with the leadership in this uh, critically important country to us um, to demonstrate, you know, our commitment to uh, being a, a constructive um, and active, engaged partner, uh, a participant in Asia generally, um, and, uh, uh, and not to put as much focus on the sort of contentious, difficult issues. But those issues are there, and uh, there's no question that he's going to have to demonstrate that, that we're uh, able to move forward, uh, that he and his administration are able to move forward um, on, these, on these issues. So to pick up on something Mike said before, um, although, you know, it, 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 it will not be likely that uh, that we will see new breakthroughs on the economic agenda, for example. You'll see uh, some, some, you know, some small deliverables that help resolve issues that have already been in the works that, that Hu Jintao has committed to or that have been committed to in the SNED, um, bringing those to closure. You know, the administration will portray that as, as sort of more significant than it probably is in, in substance, but it will, it, will, um, it will show that we're able to move forward um, and make progress. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I assume that there will be, uh, from, uh, from the Republican side, there will be uh, an effort to, uh, you know, demonstrate uh, that, that the, the Republican, um, uh, a Republican administration would similarly be able to manage um, a, a relationship with China, probably erring on the side of, of, of saying that, you know, they'd be tougher on, on some of these issues, including the economic issues, maybe Iran and other issues. I'll, I'll let others comment on that. Um, and, uh, but, but I think broadly speaking, um, uh, you know, that will be the, the positioning of both sides. Um, I, you know, I worked for the Anshin regime, um, but I think there's pretty broad bipartisan support among the experts for the overall strategy uh, of the last year. The first year was more debatable, but the last year of the Obama administration in Asia um, on substance. Um, but um, there's also, I think, some concern that perhaps the White House and State Department uh, overdid it a bit um, in this pivot or rebalancing of Asia. The, the, it was too much about China. Um, I'm a Teddy Roosevelt fan. I, in situations where you're showing your strength, it's important to speak softly and carry a big stick. And the China, the Asia trip last November was framed uh, in Secretary Clinton's foreign policy article and in some of the White House briefings, um, not Matthew, but um, uh, others. Uh, it, it was too much about China. And, and so um, it, it got to the point where, for example, in the 
uh, Singapore-U.S. dialogue already organized the past two days. Our friends, the Singaporeans, who are telling us to come into Asia, do more to counterbalance China, are now saying, slow down, tone it down. Um, it was a bit too much. And I think part of that was, uh, was actually not signaling to the region, but domestic politics here. Um, and um, uh, that, in some ways, reflects, I think, the fact that, as a candidate, um, Mitt Romney is, 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 is highlighting the economic issues, especially the currency issue with China. So in this election cycle, the China um, po policy issues have become a real football, um, which um, uh, could cause candidates, presidents, to, 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 to say things that they then have to um, adjust uh, on both sides. It's, it's not happened yet. No one's gone over the bounds, but but it's always a, 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 a it's, it's usually a problem. It happened with Clinton. It happened with Ronald Reagan. It usually happens in presidential elections that when China is a major issue, um, big tough talk happens, and then people have to adjust. I don't think any any candidate or the president have, have gotten to that line yet. But if it gets out of control, it would be a concern. Um, the uh, um, the, the the president's tough talk on that last trip may give him some room to not be quite as tough during the Xi Jinping visit. We'll see. Um, now, I don't think there's any major foreign policy speech planned for any of the Republican presidential candidates. And I'd be surprised if they actually went at the relationship with Xi Jinping, because presumably if they win, they're going to have to work, work with the same guy. But what you might see, and for good reason, is in the um, bits and pieces of press availabilities and town hall meetings and so forth in the coming week, that um, Iran, Syria, um, cyber, there's a whole range of, um, of, of, of areas where China is causing us problems. And to the extent the administration is not able to make progress on those, I think it's politically appropriate, but also it's a legitimate topic of debate for the opposition to point out these problems. But a major speech or a major assault uh, from any of the Republican candidates on Xi Jinping or on the visit would surprise me. I, would, I, I don't think it's especially good politics. We had another backbencher that's been waiting. Uh, turn it on, please. you got to hit the button. Jeff Dyer from the Financial Times. I'm just picking up on some of the uh, previous comments. Um, uh, there's been a lot of big changes recently in American security policy. Uh, there's a new military strategy that talks about shifting substantial amounts of resources to Asia, specifically mentions China as one of the main reasons for that, military base in Australia, talking with the Philippines about expanding cooperation, a whole range of things going on. Um, how should the administration, or how would you frame it to the Chinese in a way that explains this as not being about containment? I mean, you all said that it's not containment, but inevitably this will be interpreted that way in China um, by lots of people. Or way, another way of framing the question would be to say, if American strat security strategy is a, is a mixture of engagement and hedging, there does seem to be an awful lot more hedging going on at the moment and a lot less engagement. Is, is, that, is that a fair characterization? I, I'll let, I I'll let everybody so. sort of take a crack at this, but just, uh, just a note. Um, CSIS has just started the Pacific Partners Initiative. It's co-directed by Mike and Ernie. Sort of the only game in town as far as looking at the U.S., Australia, New Zealand relationship. So, and the Pacific, just a little plug, yeah. Pacific Islands. Um, you know, I, I think the the communications on this issue have not been great. Uh, I think um, the the U.S. I, to be honest with you, I think the Pentagon uh, it started pretty well actually. The president um, sent his first signal, then the secretary uh, briefed, and then Admiral Willard. You know, did some around town briefings, but the you know the the new military uh, uh, strategy um, and the and the and the budget's impact on how we work in Asia actually means that you know we are refocusing on Asia, but the footprint uh, is actually designed to be uh, very nimble, light. Uh, we're not trying to build bases around Asia. Uh, the the Australia announcement is about access and it's about being in places where countries uh, where we have deep relationships with countries that want to uh, want us to be there uh, and so that's the case uh, I think with the Philippines we're in uh, we're in discussions with the Philippines we haven't decided uh, you know exactly what that looks like yet but I think um, what you're seeing here with the with the military footprint of the United States is uh, sort of a, a smart return to 
uh, to Asia. Um, it's, and it's not a return. I think the messaging should be, this is very consistent with a long-term American security presence in, in Asia. And it's, it's sort of updating that to the modern day, modern age. So, you know, we're not going to be building new Okinawas or Korean style bases uh, in Australia or anywhere in Southeast Asia. But guess what? The Southeast Asians and the Australians, if you look at polling done by the Lowy Institute down in Australia, the, um, the actual question in the poll, I, I believe, was would you welcome American bases in, in Australia? And that was the 55 were percent were in favor. Um, so, you know, there's, it's, it's that sort of uh, response that the Americans are, are taking advantage of and responding to. And with, a, again, with a light touch, the emphasis on access, uh, joint training, interoperability, um, but not a big, bulky American footprint uh, in, in Asia. And I think that's, that can be emphasized to the Chinese. It's not, it's not big and different. It's uh, consistent and smart. I, I, would, I would just add that the presence of the United States uh, militarily and, of course, in other ways, um, is seen by the vast majority of the region as uh, reassuring and benign. Um, we have been the source of peace and stability uh, in the region for a long time. And with the uh, onset of uh, greater, what many people have referred to as greater Chinese assertiveness, um, but actions in uh, 2009, 2010, uh, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, the Yellow Sea, mm. there was growing concern in the region about what kind of power China is going to become, how it's going to use its growing military and even economic capabilities. We saw instances of the Chinese using economic coercion against Japan after the arrest of the fishing captain in September 2010, where the Chinese were seeking to restrict the export of rare earth minerals to Japan. So with growing anxiety in the region, what we saw here in the United States was a very clear message what people in the administration like to refer to as a demand signal. Um, please be more engaged, more involved. Um, we want to see greater U.S. leadership in this region. And so I think that's the, that's the backdrop. And, it, it, and yes, there's a China factor. You might call it counterbalancing China or hedging. I certainly don't think it is strategic encirclement uh, or uh, containment. When the President and the Secretary of State were in uh, Honolulu for the APEC meeting, they spent a, a good deal of time was spent uh, by uh, uh, National Security Advisor Donilon as well as Secretary Clinton with a senior Chinese uh, official, State Counselor Dai Bingua, explaining what we are doing, what our strategy is in the region, including the new deployment, the um, rotation, if you will, of, uh, of Marines uh, through, uh, through Darwin. Uh, after that, we did issue the uh, strategic, uh, the defense strategic guidelines. The Chinese are concerned. Uh, there were more discussions at the defense consultative talks in early December, but I'm certain that when Xi Jinping goes over to the Pentagon that these are topics that will be discussed. And it provides an, another opportunity for the United States to explain um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and also why we have some concerns about what China is doing uh, in the military realm and the importance of avoiding um, accidents or miscalculation between our two countries. I'll just add quickly for context, um, in some ways this began when China, when it was understood that China had built a new ballistic, or a new submarine base in Hainan, which clearly had the intent of projecting power far beyond the Taiwan, uh, East Sea, Japan uh, area, <coughs> um, followed by the, the Near Sea Doctrine, uh, um, a, a new naval doctrine that um, extended operations to the second island chain and, 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 in fact, operations not just in the South China Sea but around Japan's Pacific flank to islands between Hawaii and Japan. And so uh, the demand pull that people talk about was not just in response to the incidents in the South China Sea. There was a steady buildup over several years of Chinese military doctrine and bases and capability and ballistic missiles um, that made it logical to engage more broadly with countries and allies that were concerned in the region, and also to disperse our forces a bit more because of the ballistic missile threat. But as has been pointed out, the numbers are not actually up. It's more about where uh, we're doing things. 
Let's come over to this side, down at the end. Uh, Yong Jin De from China News Service. I think just a few days ago, a, a top Chinese official in Beijing said there is a, a trust deficit between Beijing and Washington that might fundamentally damage the U.S.-China relations. So uh, do you think, is it possible that Xi's trip will reduce the deficit and ease some the mistrust lingering on uh, both sides? And another question about the uh, we can see lots of efforts of public diplomacy uh, during this trip. Uh, do you think uh, these efforts will be effective and help American people better understand Chinese leaders? Thanks. I, I think it's possible it can help. I mean, the trust deficit is, 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 is based on some big structural factors, it's shifting balance of power, different um, uh, frankly, different political value systems um, and, um, and domestic dynamics. But I think it can help reduce the trust deficit you talk about because in many ways Xi Jinping is a lame duck. Um, Xi Jinping, excuse me, Hu Jintao. That would have been a good headline. That would have been a good headline. Hu Jintao in many ways is a lame duck. His leadership is no longer that strong. His, his line is pretty much the same line he's used for years. Um, uh, Xi Jinping is new. And if there's a sense, I think, in his meetings with leaders here, this will be more about the private than the public meetings, that he's a guy we can do business with, he's got energy. Um, you know, that could help give some context for where the relationship's heading over the next five or 10 years. Because right now, I think there's a lot of concern in the administration and the Congress that we're heading towards a very rough five or 10 years. Um, I, I would just add that there is clearly no, no Band-Aid that can solve the trust deficit. I, I think our leaders have been talking for some time about the need to build greater trust and understanding. That, that's a long-term project in the U.S.-China relationship. And, 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 and yes, every high-level visit that we have, indeed every major interaction that we have with China can contribute from the two um, or detract from uh, you know that 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 project of, of building trust and I think that both countries really do hope that we can uh, begin a process of building better trust and understanding uh, but that's you know that's not going to happen uh, overnight uh, I do think an important element of this visit is also for you know both leaders as part of this trust building project to is signal and explain to their uh, to the domestic audiences about the importance of the U.S. China relationship. Um, there's, I think, a, a growing sense in in the United States that you know China's uh, taking our jobs and it treats us unfairly. Um, maybe a not enough appreciation of where the U.S. China relationship is very important to advance uh, our interests and the prospects in the future for China bringing greater jobs to the United States through investment. And there's a lot of suspicion in the Chinese public uh, about U.S. intentions, about containment, which, as other people have said, um, is really uh, not a, a good descriptor of U.S. objectives towards China. So this is also an opportunity, I think, to explain to our respective publics the importance of the bilateral relationship going forward. That, that really, in some ways, is the most important point of the visit. I mean, these summits are kind of like date night. No matter what happens during the week, and a lot of bad things happen to U.S.-China relations, every once in a while, the leaders get together and say, I still love you, man. <laughs> if, or if I don't love you, at least I'm still going to work with you. We're still going to make this relationship work. We're still committed to the path. I hope you don't use that line on date night. No, I don't. <laughs> I still love you, man. <laughs> um, but, 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 um, but, but basically reaffirming the bargain set by basically set by, Deng Xiaop, uh, uh, by Nixon's visit, but by Deng uh, and every American president since Nixon. And that the ritual of reaffirming that is really pretty important. Yeah, just right here. Uh, thanks, Betty Lynn of the World Journal. Um, will Hillary Clinton have a tougher line um, for Xi Jinping than President Obama? And also, like, I'm sure Xi Jinping will raise the um, relaxing of export control uh, to China. And we just had a hearing, like, earlier this week, and so I'd like to know what would happen and also what kind of message will Xi Jinping get from the Hill um, at this trip. Um, also, there's a big news um, this week in China. It's concerning uh, 
Bo Xilai's former confidant, um, Wang Lijun's um, seeking well, U.S. Um, um, refuge at the consulate, and I'd like to know uh, or like to have the panel's address on what would this affect the leadership transition. Thanks. Matt, do you want to take export controls, and then Bonnie, you can. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, so, I mean, I'm, I'm inevitably, yes, uh, or certainly, yes, uh, the, the Chinese side um, will raise um, export controls as they have been doing consistently for many years. And uh, I think equally certainly uh, that issue will not be resolved on this trip. Um, uh, there, there will be, um, you know, continuing uh, presentation by both sides of why this would be beneficial from the Chinese perspective um, for the U.S. to relax uh, controls. The U.S. will explain why uh, there's a process for doing that and the and conditions uh, for doing that, but it won't be resolved on this visit. But yes, it will be on the agenda. Um, I don't think I should probably take on Hillary Clinton or the uh, or the the Chinese uh, domestic. Uh, Mike, do you know if there's a, a Hill visit scheduled? I think he is meeting with congressional leaders, but I don't know the details. But nothing that. public. Nothing public. No, no, not a presentation or a speech. A again, in 2002, part of that playbook, Hu Jintao met with congressional leaders. I would fully expect that we would want uh, Xi Jinping to hear from uh, key members of, of Congress. I would expect that that will be uh, private. Uh, but I, I, I don't know for a fact. And again, you'll be hearing from the administration. Have, have you heard? I think it's being. No, but the, the playbook. You know, the, the precedent really matters. Yes. Um, and, and it's and Xi Jinping needs to check all the boxes Hu Jintao did. And that's the measure. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I've, and Matt also has planned various summits with Chinese leaders over the years. And um, it's not a whole lot of creativity. It's not like they're looking to do something new and interesting. You know, Camp David was always a hard sell, or um, uh, even Crawford, Texas was a little bit of a hard sell. There's a real, um, uh, uh, you know, need to demonstrate precedent has been met, maybe with a little extra. So that's why the playbook is 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 fairly predictable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on your question about Wang Li Jun, uh, I was the San Francisco equivalent. <laughs> uh, you've um, undoubtedly heard what the State Department has said on this. Uh, that he was, uh, that Wang Lijun requested a meeting, that he went to the consulate, uh, he had his meeting and he left uh, of his own accord. Uh, this still does not explain what the uh, stepped up security uh, was around the consulate. Uh, I don't know what the real story is, and, and, and I think we're all still trying to separate facts from rumors. Uh, though my, my guess would be, and again, Mike would know more about this than, than, than I do, but I would think that issues like that that are pretty much down in the weeds are probably not going to come up with Xi Jinping unless there's some major problem that we think needs to be solved uh, at that level. Yeah, just here and then you can come up, make your way to the microphone after. Thank you, David Ivanovich with Argus Media. Michael, you mentioned uh, Syria and we've been talking about Iran. Um, I, I mean, we just had the double veto at the Security Council last weekend. Do you think that's an issue that the administration will press um, during these meetings, or will that be old news? It'll be nine days old at that point. Um, and likewise, do you think they'll press the issue with, of Iran? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain they'll press the, both Iran and Syria. I think your mic is. Um, you know, Susan Rice, our ambassador to the UN, her reaction to the double veto was, uh, pretty strong, and I doubt that was spontaneous. I think I'm sure that was cleared with the secretary in Washington. <clears throat> so uh, Syria and Iran will be on the table. There is, um, you know, a, a, it is difficult. Or there's no precedent that suggests that explaining to China its interests in a stable Middle East and nonproliferation and sort of reasoning with China about their own interests. There's no precedent to suggest that will convince the Chinese side to change its approach to Iran. And um, a few years ago, you'll recall Jeff Bader, the senior director, and uh, Jim Steinberg, uh, oh no, it was Jeff Bader and Donilon, perhaps, when he was deputy, in China told the Chinese, um, and they told this to the press deliberately, the US side did, so it, it was in the press, told them that there could be uh, military action in Iran. <laughs> and so um, uh, when China and the Chinese side thinks that kinetic action, military action, or 
something like that is possible in cases like Iran or North Korea, that's when you tend to get some movement on things like sanctions. Um, will they, will the administration tell Xi Jinping that um, they are concerned that there could be no option left but our military option or that Israel might take a first step? Um, possibly. I don't know what the plan is, but, but um, I think we and the Obama administration sort of have this experience that trying to explain to China China's own interests in a case like Iran has not been terribly effective, but when they are given the choice between sanctions, joining some form of sanctions, or letting things spin out of control, that's when you get some movement. And I don't know how they'll handle that, because there are a lot of issues on the table. I'm certain it'll come up. There's no doubt about that. Katie Wang with New Town Dynasty Television. Uh, we know that uh, last month, uh, U.S. Ambassador uh, uh, Gary Locke had some statement on China's human rights issue and uh, inner stability. And uh, uh, do you think that uh, fully represent this administration's view on that? And uh, as you said, um, that uh, human rights uh, is no more a token for United States uh, than to press China. Then uh, how do you think this issue will be raised in this trip, or it, it will be just off the table? Well, I think that the facts on the ground show and administration officials uh, share this view that the human rights situation in China has deteriorated. It has deteriorated not only since Hu Jintao's visit to the United States last January, but since Vice President Biden, Biden's visit to China. And it is of great concern. And Vice President Biden, as I understand it, when he met with Xi Jinping when he was there last summer, conveyed why human rights is important to the United States, that it's part of the fabric of who we are as a people. Um, and, and we believe that this is a universal issue. It's not just an issue that is an internal problem that, uh, that other countries should um, leave up to China and not, not comment on. Now, having said that, I don't think uh, that there will be uh, much discussion of individual cases. I don't think that that's the, the nature of the conversation that will be held at this point. And as, as Mike said, if, if Hu Jintao didn't do something, certainly Xi Jinping can't do it until he's actually in the position uh, of being the, the leader uh, of China. But I think it's important for Xi Jinping to understand that human rights is a, um, a concern uh, of, uh, of the United States that we're going to have going forward for the 10 years that he is in power. And it will, it will be a continuing conversation, uh, and uh, that this is something we, we, we care very much about, and the rest of the world is watching and cares about how China treats its people. And recent incidents that we've seen, such as in Tibet and the self-immolations, um, the, the, these are a problem. We'd like to see China deal more constructively with the problems that it has um, with its people. Uh, and so I, I, I think that this will be a broad but very direct and frank conversation. Um, Hu Jintao on these questions was conflict diverse. Um, and if you look back at what he's said when, when, uh, when human rights, democracy, religious freedom came up, he never challenged the, um, the proposition. Uh, so when Bob Zelik in 2005 said China should become a responsible stakeholder, Hu Jintao's next speech in the United States said China is a responsible stakeholder. When the President or other officials, Secretary of State Rice uh, in 2005 talked about the importance of democracy, Hu Jintao used the word democracy 11 times in his next speech in Washington and in his press conference uh, when President Bush was in the region said, you know, China has its own approach to democracy. He never challenged the sort of premise or the fundamentals. He just said, yes, we agree, we just have different approaches. Very conflict averse. What will be interesting with Xi Jinping is um, he has actually taken on sort of Western criticisms of China publicly. And um, I would be, it would be interesting to find out if, if we can, if in the meetings with the President and the Vice President, he actually contests the, the, the issue and says, oh, yeah, well, you have human rights. <laughs> um, I could see him pushing back more privately, and maybe even publicly, because he's done it before. The other thing to keep in mind uh, is that these meetings um, will probably be an hour with the Secretary of Defense. Um, the lunch is a 
is a very formal lunch um, uh, with a, 200 people in the audience. Um, the meeting with the president, I think, probably an hour. Um, uh, this consecutive translation, so that means it's really only half an hour because the, they have to be translated, and both sides have to say they have to say certain things. They have to say they're, they're, they can't tell their domestic audience that they did not raise certain things, and so that means that predictable positions take up 20 minutes. So, so to be, to be honest, the actual real discussion is often only, if including translation, 20 minutes. So really, only 10 minutes of kind of new things. Um, and but, but add to that that Vice President Biden will be traveling out to Los Angeles, and we'll have true. more time point. to get into some of these that's issues in point. depth. Yeah, he, he may have that opportunity. It's not clear they'll sit next to each other the entire time talking on the way out, but. They're mm -hmm. having an informal dinner, just the two no. of them, interpreters, as I understand it, in L.A. So that'll, that, will, that will give some more uh, opportunity. The other thing is on individual um, human rights cases, um, I mean, typically the president would not raise these. It would be the Secretary of State or the Senior Director or the National Security Advisor would pull aside um, the Foreign Minister or, or, or the Ambassador or someone and say, look, the president wanted me to raise this. So there's some issues that can get lateral to senior officials and, and worked um, in the margins of the meeting as well. Let's go Dan on the end, and then we'll go over in the corner. Hi, Dan Robinson with Voice of America. Um, so uh, Vice President Biden down in Florida last week, I believe it was, repeated the criticism of what he called the god-awful one-child policy. Um, and made some other comments about competitiveness and competition with China and their economy, our economy. Um, what, what has that relationship done uh, since he's taken over, as he noted in that speech, <clears throat> part of the portfolio, he said, on China? How is that relationship affecting the, uh, the way forward? know more about sort of what happened in in China but my my sense is that they had a you know a good uh, first interaction in China and that they um, you know there was good chemistry um, you know I think I wasn't on that trip so I don't know you know the details of what what was discussed but my sense is that it was uh, that it was a uh, a good uh, basic first meeting and I think a good basis for, for continuing dialogue and discussion. Um, but it goes back to the point, you know, that was made earlier. Um, uh, you know, there are things that are discussed um, in private meetings between leaders and chemistry that's developed and relationships that are built, uh, as well as, you know, tough private messages about the difficult issues. Uh, then there's sort of public consumption and things that are said for public consumption. And, and those are also a mix of, of, of both um, things that emphasize, and I think particularly on this trip, that emphasize the importance of this relationship um, and, uh, and, and why we need to, you know, why we need to engage with this, uh, with this, uh, this important country. Um, while also there's an, an important need publicly to, to talk about, you know, issues that matter to the United States, uh, ranging from, from our, uh, our, our economic issues to our uh, political issues to values issues to others. So, so I, I think it's not inconsistent that, you know, that in different forums and different uh, situations, you'll hear a little bit of all of that. I doubt that Vice President Biden is doing the equivalent of the Gore Chairman of Midden Commission, where all policy flowed through Gore and Chernow Mirden during the Clinton administration. Um, I think what he's doing is sort of taking the lead on the relationship with Xi Jinping. And in his public discourse, he hasn't quite found the sweet spot yet. Uh, you know, it was, I forget it was the Post of the Times. He had a piece on China that struck a lot of people as a little uh, pulling a lot of punches on human rights. Now he's kind of going the other direction. He hasn't quite, in his public uh, uh, explanation of U.S.-China relations, hasn't quite found the sweet spot. But, but he probably is um, the point man for developing a relationship with, with Xi Jinping, if not the overall relationship. I mean, uh, let me just say that clearly, I, just to reaffirm what Mike said, it's clearly not a gore Chernomidin type of arrangement, but it is, you know, clearly uh, Biden is going to be very involved, but it's not, a, uh, it's not that kind of structure that's being set up. No, my understanding is that a lot of what Vice President Biden is bringing to the table in this relationship and building those that rapport with Xi Jinping is really based on his own personal experience. And, and as we know, the Vice President has had um, 
an enormous amount of experience on issues that he can then use to engage uh, Xi Jinping on. And, and I'll give you one example. Um, the Vice President has been very involved in, in uh, issues pertaining to Iraq and Afghanistan. He has dealt with our military, and he understands the importance of coordination between uh, civilians and the military. And he's, I think, tried to convey that uh, to Xi Jinping. And, and tried to bring his own experience to bear. And I think this is, this is exactly how you can build a very good rapport between individuals. It's by calling on your, your own experience and then, and then trying to use that to promote the U.S.-China relationship. And, and Vice President Biden is just extremely well positioned to do that. Okay, we're running up on the end of our time, so let's take a question here. And we'll go over here and here. And we'll take them all in one round, and we'll let everybody just sort of give a last last comment. Thanks. Um, Laura Meckler with The Wall Street Journal. I have two questions, a specific one and a more general one. Specifically, do you see that um, the issues of Hollywood and intellectual property around um, entertainment likely to come up on this visit, particularly since he's going to Los Angeles? And secondly, You've all talked about, you know, a successful what the, what a successful visit looks like. It's relationship building. It's no mistakes. But how will, what should we be looking for as we're observing this visit um, to to determine whether it <laughs> to determine whether it was a success? Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yan Ho Kim with Voice of America. Um, obviously, North Korea is uh, one of the uh, uh, you know, important issues to be discussed. But I was wondering if uh, there's going to be any serious, um, eager, and specific discussion on how to get North Korea uh, to get back to table when North Korea has been harshly criticizing the South Korean government, and there's going to be an uh, election in uh, Korea in a couple of months, and also presidential elections both in uh, the United States and uh, uh, South Korea this year. Thank you. Please. Yeah, another Voice of America. I'm with the Chinese branch. Uh, still, uh, we haven't discussed the uh, dimension of Taiwan. I'd like to know uh, if how this uh, Taiwan issue will come up, and uh, especially on the sticking point issue of uh, arms sales to Taiwan. Thank you. So I, I'll, I'll do the Hollywood one. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a <laughs> direct connection. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, I don't think there's a direct connection. I think the reason for the stop in L.A. didn't relate to Hollywood per se, but. Um, I do think that there is an outstanding issue that is of interest to, to Hollywood, which has to do with the distribution of films in China, on which China lost a WTO case to the U.S., and there is the issue of how to resolve that and compensation and change in policy in China um, with respect to that. And I think that you might keep your eye open for the possibility of that being one of the, one of the deliverables. Whether it actually will be or not, I don't know, but, but I think that's one of the things they may be working on. I'll comment on the Taiwan issue. I think that given the recent elections in Taiwan, uh, the re-election of Ma Yingzhou, uh, I believe that there is great confidence in Beijing that it will continue to be able to manage its relationship with Taiwan well. Um, I, I, I do think they remain concerned about U.S. arms sales, but I don't think that they would be um, as perhaps um, panicked <laughs> about the future uh, of uh, the cross-strait relationship if the election uh, had gone the, the other way. And uh, undoubtedly, Xi Jinping will raise Taiwan. Uh, he will want to convey his uh, his concerns about U.S. policy, arms sales being one of them, and his determination uh, to reunify the country, um, that's something that he has to do for his domestic audience back home. Um, I would doubt that there will be much that the president um, or vice president will say that we have not said in the past uh, on this issue. Uh, and our commitment to the three Sino-U.S. Uh, joint communiques and, of course, to the Taiwan Relations Act um, and our desire to see peace and stability uh, maintained in the strait and perhaps a, a, a bit of urging that China begin to uh, draw down its forces uh, opposite Taiwan. I would expect that to be a fairly short conversation, however, um, given the confidence that I think that both sides have um, in, the, in Washington and Beijing that that cross-strait relationship is going to remain uh, relatively stable over the next uh, several years. I'll take the what to watch for question. Um, 
I, I think given what we've all said, uh, there's, there's a serious interest in both the United States and China on making this visit look good, meet the, meet the, uh, um, meet the uh, uh, previous uh, benchmarks that, that Mike uh, so carefully talked about. I think uh, look for chemistry. You know, if the, if, if the chemistry is, uh, is good, I think that's going to be a reassuring sign to uh, business and to Asia. Um, if the chemistry, if it's sort of awkward and, and tones uh, or, or notes uh, are, are missed, uh, on some of the issues that we talked about, if it seems a little uh, asymmetric, I think that that will be interpreted as, as warning signs uh, by the rest of Asia. Um, and so, there's a lot at stake here. I, I think that's those are the key things to uh, to watch for from my perspective. The North Korea conversation is probably going to be short and very frustrating for the president and the Secretary of State and others. Um, uh, China is blocking any effort in the Security Council to follow through on, um, for example, there, there's a working group on the uranium enrichment program that's supposed to report to the Security Council. We, we, we know there's a uranium enrichment program, and China's blocking that with, with Russia. Um, but on that one, Russia's not out front the way they are with Iran and Syria. It's primarily China. <coughs> um, the, uh, the, the main message from, uh, from Xi will be um, return to the six-party talks, get dialogue going. The administration's not opposed to um, engagement with the North in some dialogue, some discussions, but but is deeply and rightly skeptical that the North Koreans um, uh, will do any serious discussions about um, nuclear issues. And um, I suspect that there will be um, sort of, they'll be talking at cross purposes on that one. <clears throat> on Taiwan, I am, I, Bonnie's right, they will, Xi Jinping will have to raise Taiwan arms sales. He's got constituencies that will insist on it. Um, I hope and uh, believe, I guess, that the administration will um, not just sort of blow past the Taiwan discussion, um, but will reiterate, and it's important that he hears this from the President, our commitment to the Taiwan Relations Act <clears throat> and, and, and the importance of Beijing taking steps um, to um, reassure all of the people on Taiwan. Because the temptation in, for Xi will be to interpret the victory of Ma Ying-jeou as a victory for Beijing, and um, I think it will be important, even if briefly, for the, for the President and Secretary of State to point out how important it is for Taiwan and China to um, make progress um, based on the views of, of uh, everybody on Taiwan, um, and, uh, and not just dismiss this election as sort of problem solved, let's move on. Taiwan Relations Act and then our support for democracy in Taiwan, those are two really important things. Of course, the, the President will have to and should reaffirm our commitment to the three communiques and one China policy. There's a whole mantra, basically. And, it, and, and we can't sort of blow by those and assume not, we don't have to say them. It's important for Xi Jinping to hear, to hear the, whole, the whole package. I, on the North Korea piece, if I could just add that I think that at this particular juncture that the Chinese are less urgent about returning to the six-party talks, although that's ultimately their goal, than they are about signaling that this is not the time for any country to take any actions that might destabilize North Korea, that we should be doing what we can to try and promote stability and ensure that the, that the succession goes, goes forward smoothly. And I think that the United States is going to be signaling that China has a role to play in ensuring that North Korea does not take any more provocations uh, in, this, uh, in, in this coming year. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I agree with you. This is, this is not going to be a, a productive conversation. Um, I think we're looking at this issue somewhat differently. But I think the Chinese are very worried about possible destabilizing actions that other countries could take against North Korea. And I think that we're worried about North Korea taking provocations. And, and specifically, I think the worry is on our side um, that North Korea will test a nuclear weapon in 2012. And if it's a uranium-based weapon, that's very bad because it shows their enrichment is advanced to the point where they can crank out um, basically one a year. Um, and if it's plutonium-based, that's probably bad because they've done two tests. And if the third test is, is more successful because the past two have been mixed or if it demonstrates some capability for weaponization, these are all thresholds. So it's not just sort of – It's the, I think the U.S. concern or Japan or Korea's concern is not just that North Korea would destabilize the atmosphere 
although it certainly would be bad in an election year for the president, but really that North Korea, while we're all debating this, is, you know, moving forward on developing a weaponizable, deliverable nuclear weapon, and that there's no urgency about that in Beijing at all. It's all about making sure the succession is smooth. So it's not, it's not going to be an easy uh, conversation, and, and uh, if, if nothing else, both sides will state their positions. Sorry, did you just say that it's likely that they will uh, no, I think test it, in I didn't say it's likely. I mean, I personally think uh, it's likely. I don't know if that's the administration's position, but I think they're concerned because um, of um, uh, several factors. One is the North Korean propaganda line publicly for several years has been that 2012 will be the year they are a nuclear weapon state. Uh, the other is even an unclassified testimony, you hear the administration uh, explaining that North Korea is, uh, is advancing down the path towards um, deliverable nuclear weapons capability, meaning able to mount it on a missile. Um, and, and so, you know, nobody knows what, you know, Kim Jong-un will actually do. Um, but um, there is a pattern and a game plan to developing and marrying ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons capability, and that hasn't stopped. That's chugging along. And so we're looking at different things in China right now. We're worried about that moving forward. China's worried about avoiding any instability. We also worry about that. And we're, I think, increasingly talking past each other on North Korea now, um, which is not solvable in one visit. Mm -hmm. now, I think there's a broad expectation that North Korea will do something in 2012, and the disagreement in the community about is whether it's going to be a nuclear test or whether it's going to be missile tests, another long-range missile test. I think that there's broad expectation that there will be some action taken, um, with some people believing that it will be more extreme and others believing that it will be less, uh, less worrisome. That's a pretty somber note to end on. Maybe we should go back to date, date night on Valentine's Day. Uh, folks, thanks again for coming. Please get in contact with myself or Andrew Schwartz if any of these experts or any of our experts can be of help to you in your reporting. Um, and thank our experts for joining us. Thanks again. Thanks.